In this video, we're going to take a brief look at Alan Pavio's dual coding theory. Now, I'm going to present this in terms of a black box. So this is a very common um, kind of idea in cognitive science, namely that <clears throat> we might have some um, stimuli presented to a person or an animal. And in this case, up the top, we can see that we're talking about verbal and nonverbal stimuli. This is then going into the black box, so into the uh, person in an experiment, or um, so we're symbolically representing their cognitive processes um, by this black box. And then what we have coming out of the black box is a set of outputs, a set of uh, verbal or nonverbal responses. And so you can imagine that what behaviorists might have done was to simply vary the verbal and nonverbal stimuli and just um, report what happens to the responses. Now, from a cognitive point of view, however, what we want to do is to kind of peer inside the black box to ask various questions. What are the internal processes going on inside the black box? And so um, dual coding theory is one explanation of what happens to the flow of verbal and nonverbal information um, as someone might go through a series of experiments. So now if we reveal what's inside the black box, we get this um, quite kind of interesting old school box and arrow diagram of what might be happening. Let's try to break this down to understand it a little bit. So I think the first thing to, to note about this is that we have this separate verbal and nonverbal stimuli and we have lines going through the sensory systems and these go to uh, verbal or nonverbal systems and then they give rise to, to outputs. And so a very simple kind of um, coarse way of understanding dual coding theory is that it's attempting to say there's something going on inside the black box and we're proposing that there are these two separate systems. One that focuses on um, verbal things and another one that focuses on uh, nonverbal things. What we can see though behind these boxes is that we have some horizontal arrows labeled as uh, referential connections. And so um, this is basically saying that there might be some flow of information from the verbal system to the nonverbal system or from the nonverbal system to the verbal system. Now, let's have a look at these um, kind of connections or, or processes. What we can see is that there are these representational connections. And what this is really about is basically saying that when you are presented with different stimuli, these stimuli might activate different representations um, to different degrees. And so um, if you are looking at a, a word, this might go to the verbal system, for example, and it might activate um, some kind of verbal representation of what's going on. So you can imagine um, you might have some things in your brain that represent um, words. But you might also be presented with nonverbal stimuli. So let's think about um, images. And so if you're presented with an image, maybe um, this will activate verb, um, certain image-based representations um, in your brain. And what we can see here is that these have been labeled um, logogens and imogens. Now, 
this is uh, the names don't really matter. You could have come up with kind of anything really, but the, these are terms that uh, Pavio and his colleagues came up with in order to describe um, kind of verbal versus nonverbal representations. So we're still on this issue of what what are the representational connections? You you look at a word, you you read a word or you look at a picture, and so the representational connections are what is responsible for activating either the logogens or the imogens. Now, in the blue, we have this concept of um, an associative process. This represents the idea that um, when you're presented with a certain word, like chair, you then might have that word, that logogen, activated by the representational connections, but that in turn might activate um, similar chairs, like the idea of a desk or sitting, for example. So it might activate similar related associated um, logogens. And you can imagine exactly the same thing might be happening over on the nonverbal image side of things. Finally, we have these referential connections. And so um, what we're, what was proposed here is that there is some flow of information, some flow of activation between various triggered um, logogens and imogens. So for example, if you read the word chair, you, you're given this verbal stimuli of chair, the representational connections would activate um, a chair-like logogen. The associative connections might activate a couple of associated um, logogens, like sitting or cushion. But the referential connections might activate corresponding visual imagery. And so if we're thinking of um, chair, cushion, sitting maybe these referential connections are actually activating some visual imagery of these objects and concepts as well. So this slide essentially summarizes uh, what I've said. Words might activate various logogens. Images might activate various imogens. The referential processes um, are a way of kind of communication between the verbal and the nonverbal system. And so if I, just like I've said in other examples, if I, if I look at the, the word dog, maybe this activates um, logogens and then via some representational processes, this might activate some imagery um, of a dog. The opposite thing might happen. So I might be shown a picture of a dog. And so this, uh, the representational connections might activate um, some imogens representing pictures of dogs. But equally, that then might activate the, the logogen, which represents the word or the, the verbal, the concept um, of a dog. And as I said, the associative processes act to um, link these two systems. No, I made a mistake. The associative processes act to um, associate and link similar uh, representations within systems. So I think that's an important um, concept to look at. Whilst the associative processes that are highlighted in blue here represent within system associations. The green referential processes refer to between system um, associations or connections. 
Now, here is a table which uh, I'm putting up. You can perhaps pause the video to go through these um, to think about different examples. Um, I will just kind of leave you with this image. So what they have done in this um, table is to basically break down examples of what about if you're talking, talking about the verbal system or the nonverbal system. And further, we have the representational the uh, referential and the associative in, in each of these systems. And on the right hand column, we have um, examples. So I'll just mention a few. So the idea of reading it, so you're in the verbal modality, you might look at some words in a, in a book and your representational connections um, might activate various um, logogens. You might also um, undergo a task of uh, free association. So let's say that someone um, says a word to you like banana. This through the representational connection will activate um, a logogen for banana. But then um, your task is to free associate what are the other uh, concepts which are associated with banana. And so under this model of dual coding, this would utilize um, these associative connections. Similarly, let's just pick one more um, example here. Let's look at um, picture naming. So this would be an example of where you're, you're given a, a picture to look at the representational connections would activi activate a Imogen and what you might then ha have to do, a referential connection might go from your um, activated Imogen to activate the related um, logogen. And so now you might be able to say, aha, I'm looking at a chair or I'm looking at the dog, whatever it may be. So I'll leave you to go through this table um, just to think through a couple more scenarios, just to try to solidify your understanding. If that all seems um, a little bit complicated, maybe run through the video another time. If you're particularly interested, then I recommend the reference here that I've got in, in the slide. I'll also put it in the video description all I would say is that um, this is a, a good overview book chapter and the actual kind of empirical experiments were done over m many studies. Um, and so, you know, if you're particularly interested in the data uh, behind dual coding theory, then you can just search for those papers yourself. But I would only recommend that if you are particularly interested in dual coding theory.